Hello, everybody. So after I got to the real life of Sebastian Knight, I got to the defense. And I did not get stuck on page 100. And I did make a video about chapters 1 and 2. And um, I finished that. And after that, I began on Laughter in the Dark, about uh, which more later, and about my copy of which more later. So the defense was one of the most impressive novels I've ever read. I mean, I made a video about Pereira Maintains by uh, Tabuchi, and I was kind of, um, I was silent about the book. I basically made a 30 second video saying that I wouldn't talk about it because I didn't want to diminish the effect it had on me. And um, I'm not worried about diminishing the effect uh, that this book had on me because its effect was to terrorize me in a certain way, but also to delight me. I feel like they must have done some sort of like, uh, update to the iPhone to make it have a better camera or something, because this is looking extremely lucid. Anyway, I am currently much engrossed in the reading I'm, I'm doing right now, and um, uh, unbelievably to me, I'm, I'm going to wrench myself away from what I'm reading right now, which is Laughter in the Dark, and actually Bartleby, which is over there on the table, to uh, make some videos just to keep up the pace of my dispatches on leaves, and uh, yeah, and to I'll let you know what I've let uh, let you and myself know what I've completed, what I've finished reading. Anyway, Updike is really right because Updike says that those first four chapters of the uh, book, um, where his childhood is delineated, to use Updike's words, it's delineated, which is kind of an interesting term because it suggests like the path of a piece and maybe like one of the lines of a grid containing chess squares. I mean, really everything can contain a reference to chess if you think about it. I mean, the chess and sex are similarly treated by maybe the adults and, uh, and of course, uh, the, the growing up characters in the, in, in the defense. But it's, it's kind of like sex in the way that once you start thinking of things as being referential toward it, everything is referential toward it, and you, toward it, and you wind up in a kind of signs and symbols situation. And signs and symbols has been on my mind, by the way, because on a recent drive down to Tennessee, I listened to the New Yorker Fiction podcast where I want to say Mary Gateskill beautifully reads signs and symbols and it jerks tears for sure. So... In this book, Assorted Prose, which is uh, John Updike's first big book of uh, collected pieces, it's like this really tall but kind of slender paperback that I've mentioned in other videos. I think I mentioned it when I was talking about Max Beerbohm. The last, the last piece in this book is Grandmaster Nabokov, which is his review of The Defense. Um, he talks about how it, it didn't get its literal title, um, which to him seems better. I always remembered that Updike said that the title seemed better to him, but I forget that he concedes that it might have been, quote, worth exercising um, for a reason I don't understand. Anyway, Updike's right about those first four chapters being really, really delightful and special. So really the, the impression this novel gives is not one of pure terror, which is probably not what I'm going to be able to say for Laughter in the Dark. But we can uh, we can talk about it a little bit. We can uh, we can uh, put puncture some holes in its aura for me really quickly because I plan on rereading all of these books anyway. And uh, the transmutation of nostalgia to art is done as perfectly. Really, um, those first parts really reminded me that Nabokov is a scholar of Proust and a reader of Proust. And um, lately, I've been thinking more that maybe the next things I should read are. Uh, speak memory properly, and also the lectures on Joyce, Proust, Kafka, um, Dickens that are, in, um, that are in that one book that I have around and got a little bit of water on. Anyway, um, those first chapters reminded me of Swan's Way, which was absolutely bafflingly good to me when I first read it. And I feel like that same feeling of just suspended disbelief at how good the thing you're reading is uh, was, was how um, the start of the defense felt. Uh, that's kind of one of the implicit terrors in reading Nabokov is you realize that like as you realize it's so good and as it starts engrossing you more and more you start to realize I will never plumb the depths of this of this art um you know and it you you think about that and you think about the finiteness of life and stuff um you know the morning watch uh is a book that has such a different approach to a story of childhood 
um, and yet is so um, similarly affecting. Um, and I really want to reread this one more, and I want to like try to combine this with some of the fancy that is present in the defense or something. Anyway, Morning Watch fans out there, let's talk a lot more about this book. I should read it several times and make like a series of videos with numbers after them, like Morning Watch 1, Morning Watch 2, Morning Watch 3, where we read it again and again. Some of you may have the text of this in one of these kind of like slightly rare, um, you know, mass market paperbacks. I've gone through a few of these and given them away to friends. But uh, um, other others of you may have this text in the Library of America edition where it's like wedged in between Let Us Now Praise Famous Men and Death in the Family. But um, yeah, so like there are two things that Updike singles out as being like the source of, of, a uh, of, uh, of, uh, holy crap of um, Lusian's aliveness. And uh, the second one and it, uh, is, this, is the, the evocation of his chess mastery. And this is a book that I got from uh, somebody who did a chess camp that I attended as a kid, uh, Leonard S. Dickerson, who I remember as being very nice and very enthusiastic about chess. Um, and he was a national master, and I remember him teaching me to control the center of the board which um, made Tarati's off offense, which is described as being like a lot of pressure applied from the sides, um, kind of um, especially exotic seeming to me. Now, I haven't read this. I sh maybe I should read it and do a video on it. Would anyone like to see that? I mean, it would be my first time really reading a book just full of chess problems and aphorisms and, and doing a review on it. In fact, you know what? I'm going to do it. Um, you know, pencil this in. Uh, I'll, I'll read this and, um, and try to see what I can get out of it. Um, but, uh, I did pick this up from the bookshelf in my childhood home when I was gone down to Knoxville. So it, all of these things considered makes it, you know, I'm considering what if someone did a novel like The Defense for Jazz? Does such a book exist? If so, let me know in the comments. You know, I, I was talking about how I have been commonplacing. Um, <clears throat> lately I, I start, I took up the practice of commonplacing and then Somebody commented on one of my videos that it's a double-edged sword, and they still haven't explained what they mean by that. I'm, I'm waiting for their explanation. If anyone can venture a guess as to why commonplacing would be a double-edged sword, please sound off in the comments. But basically, I found this book at McKay's, and I got it because it was just two fifty, and it's a small book, and you all know I am, I'm like susceptible to just want to pick up every single small book that, that exists in the world. And it's by uh, Kenneth Koch and Kate Farrell, and I, you know, I'm kind of like a budding cokehead, but I, uh, <laughs> what a term, um, but I'm, um, I'm more of an Ashbury head and, uh, and reading his very simple childish, sorry, childlike descriptions of poems you can write that'll be like Yeats or Stein or Ashbury or something. Um, he says that you can like a poem before you understand it and be moved by it. And in fact, that is a sign that you're starting to understand it, that you're reading the poem in a good way. The best way to begin is by reading the poem several times to get used to the style. After you get a sense of the whole poem, there are some things you can do to help, your understand, help yourself understand anything that's unclear. Basically, Koch reminding me that, that this is a way to approach texts um, uh, made me cool it on the commonplacing and just say, I'm going to read through um, at a glance and then go back for anything that I think is un unclear. But really what's also remarkable about Nabokov is very little actually is like unclear. I think there are, there are mysteries, like there are mysterious inclusions and there is a like profundity of, to the like profusion of detail or whatever, and an overwhelm that can be tough to like grasp and like take away from the book. Um, and whole, you know, like you can't pack it all in your bag, but, uh, really the images and like scenes and like the events and the, even the feelings are clear, almost like dreadfully clear, you know? And so, um, yeah, so relaxing on the commonplacing and just reading the book was pleasant. Um, remarkably, the book didn't fall apart at all, even though I, I talked a mean game about how dry the spine was that's slightly convex, as I have said, like, freaking 70 times on this uh, channel. And um, I was struck by how few chapters there were. There are only 14 chapters um, in the book. Which compare you know which which was interesting compared to uh, uh, Sebastian Knight, which has twenty. 
uh, 20. And, and what a remarkable final chapter this is. Really, these endings are just so bizarrely good. Oh, my goodness. Um, I thought that the, the scenes where um, uh, Jules Verne and Sherlock Holmes are two books that the character reads as a, as a kid. Um, because, as you know, I kind of make these videos uh, quickly uh, so as to not detract from time spent reading or whatever. Ah, whatever excuse I want to use. They're just not very in-depth videos, you know. I typically leave out a lot. But I think it's important to leave out a lot because you have to consider the reader. It's like in Umberto Eco's book, Six Walks in the Fictional Woods or something, where he talks about the role of the reader in the books and stuff like that. You gotta, I gotta leave you space, you know. Your, your experience of reading The Defense and your experience of... Uh, objecting to the ending, right, or of uh, or of lamenting the hero's condition, like it's got to differ from mine. Um, and then you've got to make a video about it, and you've got to send the link to me. And when compared to Laughter in the Dark, which has uh, thirty nine chapters, I'm interested in the way uh, the amount of chapters in a book can, uh, s you know, suggest that it was constructed with like a different ethos, maybe, or um, or you know. Like, chapter length is just a huge topic. Um, I love it when it's... Like, those chap those books where chapter length is highly variable, like Moby Dick, and then there's ones where chapters seem, I think, a little bit more methodical and maybe uniformly sized, like in the case of maybe Sebastian Knight or maybe The Scarlet Letter or something. Um, there are cases like these where it feels like chapter length is like a key to understanding the mindset of the author which is a key to enjoyment as a reader because you kind of want to enter the mindset of the author to um, go away from the book and retain some of the lucidity it inspired in you. Okay, let me think. What am I not saying about the defense that I could say right now? Every time I make one of these videos, I always just like while it's uploading think, oh, I didn't talk about any of the things I actually think about this book. The parts of the book where music and chess are, are confused are, are confused are just really, really beautiful to me for obvious reasons. It's like the intersection of um, the, my enjoyment of the book with one of my actual aloof concerns, which is, um, which is music, you know? Um, so, uh, yeah, so I thought the, the description of a chess move as introducing a motif that kind of echoed in the, in, in his, in the other player's mind, like a piece of music echoes in a, in a, in a kind of composer's mind as the composer listens, and then there are echoes that the composer can then offer back up and write back in, uh, in a sense to that, um, that piece of music that they heard so that there's like a musical conversation going on, a kind of call and response. And that being what, go what goes on during a, a chess match. I thought that was a really interesting, uh, I mean, that's just so interesting. That's like a whole, you know, make a, make a monograph on that or something. Uh, I feel like this video has already gone on for a while, so I think I'm gonna like leave it at that. Um, this book needs to be experienced to be believed. Uh, you know, content warning, you know, the ending is pretty intense, but it's beautiful. Um, uh, you, if you like nostalgia or if you like, um, um, I don't know, if you like fearless explorations of seemingly dangerous mental states, you are gonna get a lot, lot, lot out of this book. And, uh... I wish everyone a happy day of reading.